Welcome to Monster Men. It is way too early to arg. Yes. This is our very I first. Am, this, where's the arg? I, <laughs> All right, here we go. Arg. <laughs> <laughs> Arguing at 930 in the morning is just not easy. Thank Especially you when, you know, it. you had a few drinks the night before. <laughs> so good for you. Look, so Jack, this is special. This we is... teased the hell out of this. This is special. I haven't seen this man in quite a while so i'm pretty happy okay so first of all this is maybe the biggest moment for me in monster man history because i have two of my best friends in the world from two different times of my life but my the course for me my friendship with both of you is very similar this is my buddy morgan who if you've watched this show how many times have i just thrown off yeah me and my buddy morgan Mm -hmm. um morgan's my other brother from another mother. We went to college together and we have all the same stuff in common. We were roommates and we like all the same stuff. And uh, he's one of the guys I call whenever I need to talk about whether I need to talk about the new King Kong movie or a life decision I have to make. This is my my man. And we have all been together at Chiller Theater. That was a great moment for me getting you two together. So Morgan yeah. is a a uh, official monster man who's never been on the show. We finally but got we on mentioned the... him about three dozen times yeah. on the show, at least. And the man who gave you the uh, exorcist kit. Yes. That episode was awesome. <laughs> I should have brought that upstairs. Um, so first of all, welcome, Morgan. Thank you. It's awesome to be here. <laughs> uh, obviously, I've been a big fan of the show, and I'm excited to do this. Yeah, this is great. So we will have you on other shows anytime you want to talk about movies and uh, your Godzilla collection, which I didn't even realize you had, <laughs> is something that we need to talk about someday. But Absolutely. One of the f- most interesting things about you is that we both had this common interest in um, all things spooky. So when we lived together, we were in Salem and we would go to Halloween on in Salem and We'd, we'd sneak around the back of Lori Cab at the head witch's um, shop at midnight or whatever. And we, we would go do, go to, we, we uh, met a guy who was like a ghost hunter guy from Salem and we've got experiences. But since I've met you, you've been, uh, you're way more intellectual than I am. And you studied philosophy and, and you had a better grasp on sort of some of the bigger questions in life than the simple Forrest Gump that I am. And <laughs> run, Jackie, run. In the million years since we graduated, you've not only like I have a, you know, surface level knowledge of, of things like the occult and stuff like that, but you've kind of done some study and some uh, investigating into things like ceremonial magic and the occult to the point where it's, it's hard for me to like to tell Hunter about what you do because I'm like, I don't know. He does this stuff and he tells me about it. I've been to his house and seen some of the things he's got. It's, it's cool. Some of it scares me. Some of it, it fascinates me. And I just told him kind of the rules were you tell me as much as you want or don't, but the two rules are if you get proof of an afterlife or if you're ever able to shoot lightning out of your hands, like the emperor, you have to tell me sure that, so what we thought was if you could take us on sort of a journey behind the scenes of ceremonial magic and the occult and your journey, uh, and just let us ask the stupid questions that we've come up with off the top of our head <laughs> as, right. as we go. That sounds stupid good. Stupid questions? No way. <laughs> <laughs> right. So, you know, as you said, we have really similar upbringings. We both grew up in the kind of New York metropolitan area, watched the same stuff. You know, we're both fascinated by things like In Search Of with Leonard Nimoy. I was always really interested in fringy things. Like that's one thing that's been constant through my life. And so it started first with kind of reading a lot of books about uh, cryptozoology, about UFOs, about ancient Egypt, about all of this stuff, right? And was kind of fascinated and, and occasionally 
when you're looking through those books, you might see books on magic by like Aleister Crowley or or uh, witchcraft or whatever. And was always kind of tangentially interested, but at the same time was like a little bit afraid, mm -hmm. primarily because I grew up in a in a I would say you know, Protestant evangelical environment. My mom. Uh, was extremely and continues to be extremely religious, but in a really, um, I think, healthy way in that she never kind of was screaming about hell and was it was never about that. And so I always saw her relationship with God as being a pretty positive thing, but at the same time was going to these churches that were, you know, satanic panic stuff and backwards masking and Satan and this and that and everything else. And so kind of saw this weird view of things which really distorted my perception i think of some of the stuff we met in college right gordon college christian environment go to chapel a couple times a week learn theology learn all of this you know christian doctrine stuff at that point um i think any remnants that i had of a um what would be considered mainstream christian worldview evaporated as I started to learn about the history of the church and the somewhat almost arbitrary way that the canon came together, learned about like the fact that you know, the gospels were written decades, if not a hundred years after Christ lived. And you're like, okay, so wait a second, like this shit it could be all made up, right? You know? Um, and, yeah. When and, you think about it, if you tell somebody a story today, within five days when they retell it, it is bears very little resemblance to what you just told them. All we exactly. hear about is fake news for something that came out a week ago. <laughs> that's right. That that's right. And and so you know, for for those of you who are of the Christian persuasion, you know, it's got a happy ending. I'm in a good place now. It doesn't look like <laughs> anything that's mainstream Christianity, but yeah, I believe in God and I believe that Jesus is the Son of God. Now, you know, maybe things aren't super literal, but there's a lot of good that I've been able to find through uh, reading things from like Thomas Keating and Richard Rohr and stuff like that, where it's become something I could, I could embrace. But going back to college, right? Uh, at that point, uh, and for, for some time after that, uh, I felt very much like agnostic. Like, I don't believe that the Bible is literal. I don't believe that any of these things really happened as they are, you know, portrayed. And I for particularly don't believe a lot of the things that became part of mainstream Christianity probably in the last 100 years. Because I think, and I don't want to be too religious on this, I want to get to the fun stuff. But mm -hmm. b bottom line is, what we know as kind of mainstream Christianity, a lot of it was formulated in the last 100, 150 years. And that right. what, what the people who practiced it for the previous 1,800 years, that's not how they did it. Right. And mm -hmm. so the more I was reading, the more I was finding like, oh, OK, like this is all just really recent stuff. So um, at the same time, while I was at Gordon, I had an internship uh, working at the cable TV channel, which yeah. Jack helped make some videos and helped me finish some projects, which was awesome. Uh, so Beanie the Elf will forever be <laughs> that was a greatest... something I think of fondly. But my my supervisor there <laughs> lived in Salem and she was part of Lori Cabot's coven. Right. And that was my first introduction to more modern witchcrafty kind of stuff. And it seemed pretty kooky, but you know, she introduced me to a couple of people. Uh, it was all like very female heavy, which not horrible. Um, some heavy females, uh, but you know, it was, <laughs> it was it, you know, it was it was kind of an interesting thing, but didn't you know? At no point in time did I think like, oh, like I want to pursue this or get deeper into it. But it was fun to get that perspective and start to understand a little bit more of what it was really about because I've been so conditioned to think like, these people are Satan worshippers. These people do this. These people do this, and it totally wasn't that, right? So after college, for a number of years, was just kind of a little bit you know, uh, really much in this agnostic frame mind and really like thinking like, okay, material world is all that exists. And at some extent, I was a little bit disappointed because, you know, I grew up in this world of total possibilities. All these things could be real. All this could be real. Santa Claus could be real, you know, 
And to think that my worldview had been so kind of constrained was was a little bit disappointing, right? Yeah. Um, then we started having kids. I realized I needed to get back into shape because I was a mess physically. Uh, found a martial arts um, place that was not too far from my house. Uh, and started to go there. And what was interesting was um, the martial arts that they practiced there were, were shit, right? But the guy who ran it was clearly into a lot of things. And so he did, in addition to the martial arts classes, did a lot of meditation training and started doing other stuff that he was calling astral projection and he was doing all these other things. And I was like, well, okay, uh, you know, I'm, I'm going to approach this with an open mind and see what happens. Hmm. So, he we were doing these exercises and he would do this one practice where he would basically get you in this room there would be a few of us we would do this kind of pretty intense meditation and then he would say okay i'm going to go into the other room uh so and and he had this really beautiful facility because he had like four or five acres uh like a nice pond and woods and buildings and all this other cool stuff so he's like i'm going to go in the other room I'm going to put something on my desk, right? I'm not going to say what it is. All I want you to do is imagine that you are there. And instead of trying to guess the thing, because you'll never guess it, just take any kind of impressions that you're getting. Could be visual, could be physical, could be, is it man-made? Is it natural? What's the texture? What's the smell? What's this? What's that? You know, okay. All right. I'll give it a shot. And so I have my notebook. And I'm just kind of drawing these sketches, doing this stuff. And it does, you know, stuff doesn't make sense. I'm like, well, okay, it's natural, but it's man-made. And it's got like this weird texture and it's got this strange shape and it's got all this other stuff. And I drew a picture and I kind of shaded it in where it made sense. Right. And I'm like, mm -hmm. I have no idea what this is. Right. So he walks in and he's got this stone that was carved. It's like almost um, Neolithic-ish kind of thing. And it looked exactly like the picture, right? <laughs> Jesus. And I'm like, that's really weird. Like, yeah. I mean, it was absolutely 100% like the thing. So you go, okay, that's strange. And then and then we do it again. And, and so more times than not, I would look at the picture, I would look at the thing and say, oh, okay. So you know, the more I tried to guess what it was, the worse I got. But the more I just relied on impressions, the better I got. And he would do other stuff like uh, we would be in the other building. He would say, okay, give me a ring or your watch or your necklace or whatever. He would go walk around this multiple acre facility for like half an hour. Okay. He'd come back and then he would just look at us and he'd say, okay, go find your thing. Right. Mm -hmm. Like, oh, come on, dude. You've been walking for like half an hour. Like, how the hell am I going to do this? And it was a little bit rainy and stuff like that. So I just kind of closed my eyes. I'm walking around. I sit down on this bench. I'm like, no idea. No idea where it is. And I give my, my wristwatch, right? I look down and right next to, underneath the bench, right next to the leg of the bench is my watch. Jeez. Okay. <laughs> now, let's keep in mind, I have never felt like I had gifts or any of that shit like a lot of people say and I'm not saying gifts or shit I'm just saying I didn't have anything there was no indication that I had any psychic ability or could talk to spirits or could do any of this stuff right so for that to happen uh really I think was a, a shock mentally and psychologically like okay my view of the world doesn't have any place for this you know like where I was then like, I thought all of that was baloney. Right. And so for that to happen to me, I was like, okay, I need to expand my view of the world. Re Let me that jump is, in. I'm oh, sorry. Yeah, go ahead, Jack. Morgan's been my tour guide because his experiences would be with, with them. Like, when I talk to you, Hunter, and I'm like, well, I think there might be something else out there because Morgan went through this. You know, right. it's never my experience. It's what he did. Or you're my ghost one. Where I'm like, well, I don't know if there's ghosts, but my buddy Hunter lives with one. 
when he when he had these experiences, he called me and told me about it. You know, besides my mouth being on the ground, I'm like, oh my god, you're Doctor Strange. Yeah, I was freaked out. <laughs> I was freaked out. Jack was the first person to call. I was like, you are not going to believe this. I don't even really believe it, but it happened, and I have like documentation. So right. it's not just like after the vacuum. Oh yeah, you know, I talked to that astrologer, and that could be right, and that could be right. I mean, I had stuff I wrote before I knew the answer, and it matched. I had a question. Now, how long were you studying meditation with him before you got to this point where you could? Not super see- long. Maybe, maybe six months, maybe nine months. See, because when you tell me this, it just makes me think I've had instances in my life with no, well, I've done meditation for years, but prior to that, I've had moments where I once found a child that was taken out of his yard. And I went, woke up, I was hungover, it was college, and I heard a commotion in the street. and the boy across the street was missing and everybody was out. Cops hadn't gotten there yet. And I literally just, I was like, oh, Christian's gone. And I remember getting in my car and I just drove specifically to where he was walking between two people, plucked him from both of them and just drove back home and gave him back. Yeah. And another time when my wife lost a ring in a dark baseball field, it was like one o'clock in the morning. There were no lights. And she goes, oh my God, my ring's gone. And I just walked to this spot. Oh, well, there it is. So it's a, I think sometimes when you're not overthinking it, maybe that's what helps. Like yeah, you said, yeah. When you're trying I, to guess, you screw yourself up when you let it come. Yep. Yeah, and I, I've never felt like I had this super strong intuition or anything like that. But, you know, you have those experiences and you're like, well, okay, like there's something. Something is going on, right? right. So that started me, and, and again, this is about 20 years ago, right? And that started me like on this quest to be like what is going on and how can i reconcile this with what i was thinking about and all that started to do a lot of reading came across a writer and jack i sent you one of his books named robert anton wilson robert anton wilson was a really interesting character there's videos on youtube he's written a few books some of them are pretty out there some of them are a little bit less so but what what really resonated with me about wilson's view of the world was he believed that everybody uh, as just part of like normal development develop you know lives in what he calls a reality tunnel and the reality tunnel is based on your beliefs it's based on your experiences it's based on that all of that stuff right and everybody's reality tunnel is essentially unique right but you can have pieces come into it maybe uh, a religious belief set it may be a uh, political belief set but basically what that does is now filter everything that you experience goes through that reality tunnel which then ultimately ends up with what you believe and and to give you an example right if you think about um uh, visitations from extraterrestrials right so so historically that's a relatively modern thing it kicked up a lot you know in the last hundred years prior to that when people had experiences they attributed it either to angels or to fairies uh or to whatever right and so so what's happening in you know in as in uh in robert anton wilson's world is their reality tunnel is shaping their experience right right so if somebody sees something in the sky 500 years ago it's an angel right or they see something in the woods 500 years ago yeah it's a werewolf uh, now it's aliens, right? Same kind of um, phenomenological kind of sensory experience, but interpreted a very different way. So the reality tunnel idea was interesting, but what was more interesting was when he said, you can choose your reality tunnel, right? You can choose the world, the kind of world that you live in just by selecting for those things that you want to basically become part of your worldview, and you don't have to only have one. You can shift your perspective on things uh, when it makes sense and what and what makes what what you know is relevant for your situation. You know, it doesn't mean that you can say, "Well, I live in Dragon Ball Z world," but it does it does mean that I can choose to interpret things differently, just kind of based on my reality tone. And so, um, so when I realized that. You know, I kind of made a conscious decision to say, I want to live in a more magical world than I live in. 
And so I'm going to look for things and experiences that are going to be consistent with that um, and um, and just make things a little bit more fun for myself. So right. um, so that was a that was a kind of big turning point for me. Uh, then started to read a lot of different things about different magical traditions or different magical movements, started looking into ceremonial magic, started looking a lot about chaos magic, which started in the 1980s, which very much aligns with that idea of you can choose your your belief set and you can shift your belief set at any point in time. I think the other thing that Wilson provided for me was this perception of you don't necessarily ever have to ascribe like the reality of something to be able to experience it. So instead of saying, I think, I think this thing that I am interacting with is a demon or an angel or whatever, basically say it appears to me right at this point in time that mm -hmm. the experience I'm having is interaction with a thing, whether it's, you know, a voice in my head, my psychology, a thing outside of me, whatever becomes less relevant. And it's more about the experience. And then right. the one other point that he makes a lot is the whole notion of like the map is not the territory, right? When you when you look at a map, the map is a specific representation of a thing, but it is not the thing. The menu is not the meal, right? So you can use different maps of things to um, help maybe shape your view of things or your perspective on things. And so, so where it becomes relevant with this occult stuff is, you know, there's a lot of different maps. You could be an astrology person, right? And the, the kind of the worldview of astrology becomes your map of how you interpret things. Uh, you could be into the, uh, Kabbalah and the, so the Kabbalistic tree of life and all the other Kabbalah, uh, Kabbalah stuff would, would filter that. You could be a Christian, right? And that becomes your filter for everything. So where it becomes really cool is say, today, I'm going to think about things as an astrologer, or today I'm going to think about things as a ceremonial magician or a chaos magician or, or whatever, and be able to use that to help influence how you're interpreting the situation and, the, and the, the, the stuff that you're getting into. So that that then opened up tons of possibilities for me because I didn't feel like, okay, to do this thing, I have to 100% buy into it and become, you know, drink the Kool-Aid for whatever it is, and then right. do that thing. So, so I started then saying, all right, now that I've got this flexibility, like, how do I learn this stuff? Because there's mm -hmm. tons of books out there, and there's a lot of shit books. There's some really good books, right? There's a lot of sketchy guru type people of all persuasions online so like well, yeah that's the problem now it's yeah. the proliferation of this stuff like even if i'm trying to look for something that's good from the ufo field i'm like going well who's a crackpot and who's not like who's even handed and who is so far into one camp like you were talking about i like have you ever read jacques valet's uh passport to magonia no because it's no. talking of like what you're talking about before like what we interpret as ufos have been interpreted a million different this is a phenomenon that has been around for as long as mankind, but we yeah. just give it a different name. Different epochs have different names for it. Yeah. Um, and that got me thinking, I wonder if all of this is related, like everything. There is no separation of the, the Bigfoot on the ground with this lights in the sky and the strange boy in my house. They, I think they're all together. Mm -hmm. I just don't know what that name is, yeah. you know? Yeah, 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 yeah. No, I, I, I agree, and, and you know, I think one of my big takeaways uh, that has helped me and it's kind of a constant urge to like be like oh yeah this is real uh, I don't know what's real anymore right mm -hmm. I can speak from my experience I can speak speak for how things appear to me I can I can you know say that certainly the more I commit to any particular working or thing the usually the better results I get um, so, so where I was at you know I'm, I'm looking around trying to figure out something I found a book that that kind of seemed like it was written from a reasonable perspective and was the the the, the scholarship was very good and it was very well researched but but the author took some you know he took some ideas and I, I said well maybe this guy could point me in the right direction right mm 
Mm-hmm. So I sent him an email and said, hey, cool stuff. I'm really trying to figure out what I want to do. Uh, and he said, well, you do realize there's a group like that's maybe 30 minutes from where you live. I know the people. They're not nuts. You may want to talk to them. Right. Mm-hmm. So I reached out to them and um, the, it seemed like a decent, uh, decent group of people. It was, I think, a pretty good cross section of stuff that they were focused on so it was things like tarot and other forms of divination it was things like kabbalah it was things like um theurgy which is kind of god working angel working um it was ceremonial magic it was all this like long list of stuff that was like yeah you know this looks interesting so um so i was initiated into that organization some years ago uh interesting thing about that was um they were doing at that point in time initiations in a in a uh, universalist church, right? Mm-hmm. And the day of my initiation, some dude was kind of scrounging around the periphery of the building, and he looked a little sketchy. And finally, somebody confronted him, and he said that he was a, a vampire and werewolf hunter, <laughs> and that he heard. <laughs> awesome and uh he he had heard that there was going to be some kind of satanic ritual that was going to be happening that evening and he just wanted to make sure that there were no kids that were going to be um hurt now you know they did he was escorted off the grounds and hey god bless that guy yeah 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 well he's he's had a interesting checkered past or you know like you don't find many werewolf hunters out there no, you really don't. You really don't. So I, I felt, hunters, yes. I felt kind of honored that you know, for my initiation, it at least raised the attention of the the werewolf hunters of the world. So that was cool. So that's when you know you're in like a legit organization. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. For sure, for sure. Now, now, you know, little kind of digression. I think one of the things that that has been interesting to me is that you hear about all of these different organizations, these occult groups, some of them are, you know, kind of uh, made popular by Aleister Crowley, like the OTO or the AA, or like things like the Hermetic Order of the Golden Dawn, or any any of these other kind of groups. And you're like, oh, they've got the secrets. And some people are like, yeah, they're part of the Illuminati and all all that stuff. And and I think without an exception, uh, and, and they say they've got all of these secrets right without exception when you get into it and you start to explore you're like these are the secrets you were talking about Mm -hmm. right Right. like some of this stuff i i can just go to a bookstore and read all about this now it's a little bit misleading because words are just words if you actually do the work you start to see oh okay like this is a path for in some cases personal development in some cases it's acquisition of magical skills and abilities or whatever so um so after that initial sort of disappointment of like oh like i don't see anything really cool here then you start to do the work and you're like oh yeah the secrets all of the secrets are in front of our eyes all the time right Mm -hmm. and they look pretty mundane a lot of times um, but it's really about kind of digging in and doing the work, and then you start to see interesting things. So over the, you know, over those 20 years or whatever, I've joined a few different groups. Um, I have done a lot of um, other kind of practice and investigation. I have found myself in a lot of really weird situations with <laughs> uh, sometimes really strange people. I don't think I've ever put myself in too much danger. I think. Um, I did when I was in Mexico City, went to the, the occult market there, and that was probably about the scariest environment that I've been in. Uh, I was in Haiti back when I was much younger and was around some voodoo folks. And, you know, so like I, I think the uneducated or the kind of, you know, pre looking into this stuff part of me would have been absolutely freaked out with this yeah. stuff. Um like but the never... first time I ever walked into a botanica. Yeah, yeah. Ever go into one of those? Absolutely, absolutely. I had a girlfriend bring me into one of those. I'm like, what am I looking at right here? I'm like, should I even be here? Because I was, yeah. I, I was not far from being an altar boy at yeah. that point. And I was like, I, I, I don't know if I should even touch anything. In here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, <laughs> botanicas are great. I, you know, I think that 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 represents probably, depending on where you live geographically, probably some of the best esotericish, occultish kind of stuff that you can have access to 
-hmm. So, you know, up here, I've got some candles from a botanica that's over in Burlington, North Carolina. And what's fun about going into there is, you know, first of all, I don't necessarily fit the profile of, of their clientele, right? I'm, you know, mm -hmm. I, I don't speak Spanish very well. That's not right. my heritage. It's, you know, so generally what I'll do is I'll go in and I'll ask some questions about, you know, do you have this? Do you have this? Do we have this? And then they go, oh, this guy knows what he's talking about. And then they'll start to show me other stuff. Maybe we'll have a conversation about a particular saint or about a particular way of working. And then you can like really have an interesting interaction. But yeah, Botanica is, you know, they'll freak anybody out the first time you walk in. I would just constantly buy El Aguaz. I was like, oh, those things look cool. Can I get another one of those? Yeah. And then I, I put them all on my desk in the 90s when I was working in the phone company. And this uh, Spanish girl who worked with us saw them. And she was like, why do you have those there? <laughs> I'm like, well, they look kind of cool. That's my El Aguaz collection. She goes, no, you can't have those. A cultural I'll take appropriation. Them from you. She's like, those, it, it, those are dangerous. And you don't know what you're doing. So she took them all from me. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, eh, fine, whatever. See, luckily, I'm Italian, so all we needed was the horn that yeah. looks like a red pepper, <laughs> and it just protected us from everything. You got to watch <laughs> out for the malocchio, man. The evil eye is. Yeah, is, well, that's what it was for. Yeah. You putting the maloik on me? <laughs> it's scary, scary stuff. It's very scary stuff. So, um, yeah, so with, uh, with some of those groups, they were very much focused on ceremonial magic. Uh, they take a very conservative approach like uh, uh to like you're not jumping in and summoning demons or talking to archangels or doing any of these kind of really potentially problematic things up front it's almost like martial arts mm -hmm. you're not sparring on day one you're learning fundamentals you're doing a lot of things that look very much like personal development independent of you know anything else um so the one thing i've taken away i was speaking to somebody yesterday about this you know, like if I ask myself, do I feel like I'm a better person, a better husband, a better father, better son, better, you know, friend, whatever. Now that I've been doing this since before. Yeah, absolutely. Because it has been a lot of introspection, and a lot of personal development work, a lot of kind of working through issues to be able to then say, OK, you know, and when I'm performing a ritual or whatever, this set of experiences is mostly my baggage. Right. right. This isn't like a real experience. This is me just dealing with unresolved whatever. So that's kind of an interesting aspect to it. I think that that a lot of people miss in that, um, like I said, when you look at the secrets, you're like, well, this is meditation. This is this, you know, this is like working through my shadow issues. This is whatever. Like this doesn't look like demon summoning, right? Mm -hmm. So um, what you find, though, as you do that, there is they're they're big in addition to things like divination and and uh, Kabbalah they're big on alch alchemy right and right. most people say oh alchemy is turning lead into gold but there's a there's a process uh, depending on who's you know like model you're using but like basically a seven step process for for alchemy that you can apply as a map to all kinds of things right personal mm -hmm. development included. Um, so and and you can do practical alchemy with like plants before you start working with metals or anything else. So I've got in the other room a pretty big chemistry set up for doing distillations and creating tinctures and creating all kinds of stuff with that, which is which is pretty fun. So so I started then kind of getting more experience with divinations and tarot and geomancy and astrology and all of the stuff. And, and, you know, astrology is a thing I'm going rationally. I don't believe that the planet that I see in the sky has any influence whatsoever on me. Right. But if you look at it as a model and you start to like do some of the practices or learn how to develop a natal chart or do horary astrology or whatever you're going to, uh, at a minimum, on the web. Hey, you shut up. Sorry. <laughs> it's the spirit. It's the spirit. Talking to you. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> at a minimum, it gives you a way to interpret things that might give you new insights and the tarot, the same thing, right? Tarot may stimulate ideas about a situation uh, that will help you figure out how you want to proceed on something. 
you know, does it mean it tells the future? Well, I, I don't necessarily believe that. I mean, the way I do tarot is I will use it to gain insight on a situation. And I'll say what factors are in play here, right? And when I do readings that way, I get very good information uh, that can usually help me make choices through a situation, right? So that's, that's cool. Um, so, you know, over the course of time, I'm participating in these organizations, um, one of which, uh, you know, is really clear, like when you are initiated, it's a pretty spooky situation. You, you make an oath, um, part of which in that group is you're not going to do any evil magic, right? Mm -hmm. you're, you know, you're not going to, and I think that that's all good stuff because I, I, you see people who are, um, really bad intentions, people who are hurt, you know, physically or emotionally and using this as a thing to do stuff, which I don't feel like, you know, let's take whether or not it's real and works out of it. But for them to focus all that energy and emotion on hurting somebody isn't good for them. No. Mm -hmm. Right. I like so, hate. hate is no good. Yeah. No, it it's just do not you any good whatsoever because the person you hate probably doesn't know or care. That's right. Just hurts you. Just hurts yeah. you. So, you know, I, so my, my boundaries have been pretty firm, regardless of who I'm working with, what kind of practice I'm doing or whatever. Right. I'm, I'm not doing anything to hurt anybody. Uh, I will not do anything that involves blood. I will not do anything that involves hurting animals. Um, however, you know, I do have friends that are um, pretty active in like the, the African traditional religion, religion stuff or some mm -hmm. of the Caribbean stuff where that is part of their practice. And so that to me, you know, that's not not necessarily for me, but I don't look down on them and be as being like, oh, that's that's bad because that's a, that's far different. That's a religious practice. And that's far different from, you know, some kids killing a cat out in the woods in a pentagram. Right. No, right. they actually have a. I'm living in a city and there's actually a place that sells chickens. Yeah. Maybe 20% are for consumption. The other 80% are for ceremonies. Jesus. Yeah. 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 I'll no, take you down. I'll take you down that's there. For real. That's for real. I mean, that, that market in Mexico city, I mean, that you can buy any, just about any animal for, for ritual. And, um, I don't, I don't necessarily have a problem with that. Like I said, that's, that's not for me, but I don't really have a problem for that. So, so what I have been doing, um, has been working with these groups. Um, I have been, what, what I, you know, my normal practice looks very ceremonial magic heavy. Uh, I do some Kabbalistic stuff. I do some, uh, folk magic kinds of things. I do a lot of work with the saints. Um, it's, it's pretty much a mixture of stuff based on that realization. Like, yeah, I could do anything, right. As long as, uh, I'm not breaking my rules. And as long as I'm shifting my perspective to say, okay, let me do this thing. Let me commit to it, at least in the moment, to like, to act as if it's a real thing. Right. And, and see what happens. Right. Now, do you believe in the saints as the in the way that a Christian believes in the saints and what the things described to them that made them a saint? Or like, like how do you use them in a ceremony? So, Which, um, Okay, so when, when you talk about saints, you've kind of got at least two classifications of saints, right? You've got the saints that are sort of officially still recognized by the Catholic Church, and then you've got these sort of renegade saints, right, um, that are not necessarily officially recognized by the, the Catholic Church, but are— Like Drew Brees. Uh, Drew Brees, perfect <laughs> example. If he wins today— you know, so so um, I don't you know, if, and, and if you look in botanicas, you will see a lot of representation from these kind of peripheral saints things. And I don't know the status of St. Expedite these days, but St. Expedite is is a very popular saint for people who are looking for quick resolution for problems that they're having. Right. Mm -hmm. You'll also see folks like St. Cyprian, who's completely not recognized by the Catholic Church, but St. Cyprian prior to converting to Christianity was a practitioner of necromancy and black magic and working with demons and doing all kinds of stuff. So he was trained in all of these different, like pretty dark things and then became a Christian and was martyred along with St. Justina. Uh, and then, and is revered by many, uh, particularly in like Spain 
parts of Scandinavia, uh, parts of South America as a very powerful saint because he's got that kind of dual-sided capability that he right. understands the darkness, he understands the demonic, he understands all the things, but he's also got these connections to God. So he becomes sort of the patron saint of sorcerers and magicians and things like that. He's like so, Batman. Yeah, yeah, the no, dark he's, side, he's, but he's, like... he's a pretty cool dude, right? So, so do you call ahead. upon? Uh, sorry, I, I don't know what this just fascinates me. Yeah, do you call upon them into learning from their wisdom, or for them to actually intervene currently, sure, and assist in what you're doing? Uh, both, both, right? Okay. I think the fact that the fact that Cip and, and you know part of Cyprian's tradition is there um there was multiple multiple books almost like grimoires some much smaller that are attributed to saint cyprian um primarily again in like iberian peninsula some in scandinavia where like you get a book of cyprian you can find them online now you get a book of cyprian it's got spells it's got all kinds of stuff you can do there's all these other things right so so that is one way that you can work with him he mm -hmm. can also be kind of um, uh, a pathway and a conduit and a, and a sort of a diplomat to be able to make connections to other spirits. Right. Um, you know, so, so if, if you establish a relationship with St. Cyprian, you can call on St. Cyprian, so St. Cyprian to say, Hey, I, you know, I want to do this working. I want to work with um, m maybe some more of these infernal ish, entities and he will act as the middleman to say yep this person is okay to work with and you know he has my full endorsement and you know go for it um so you there's a lot of different ways you can you can work with him as well as well as with the other saints and, right. and, and to be able to um get some kind of effect because if you look at the the world of things right uh in the grimoires uh and in the in the the saint history like different saints are good for different stuff just like different grimoire spirits are good for different stuff right. um i think at this point probably good to clarify like term demon um because demon has got some very specific connotations in the the judeo-christian world um in a lot of cases my personal opinion and again, like for everybody out here who knows about this stuff, everything I'm saying is my personal opinion. So, you know, you disagree. That's cool. I don't have an issue with that. Uh, but if you look at the, uh oh, did we lose me? We lost you. We can still hear you though. Okay. You got close and you zapped the do mic. You to, do you have to the click camera. the uh, the video camera? Let me check my video camera. Apparently, some something doesn't like me talking about this. Oh, so we will fix we will fix that. I will tell you something, Morgan. Years ago I was writing this um I wanted it to be there a novella go. about Jesus. And Jesus uh was actually his real name was Fess Fester. And he was this drunk Uncle? He, kinda like Uncle Fester, yeah. And it was <laughs> his like, miracle was he could make a light bulb. <laughs> <laughs> it was just this really dark comedy about him. And this was you know him in modern times and shit and he had he had an allergy to wood and nails and it was so <laughs> stupid but it as i was writing that story i had two computers completely die on me yeah and then uh, the disc that i saved that story on was corrupted and the story was gone yeah and i was like you know what fuck that story <laughs> yeah no i love when weird shit happens like that like you just you know don't even think about that and then you go well, wait a second something's going on here somebody's trying to send me a message of of what i need to do yeah so okay so demons right um if you look at the grimoire tradition most of the grimoires that um that i have worked with and continue to work with are sort of like a renaissance era of which then there are sort of historical iterations of those um some of which like kia solomon um, or, or things like any of the things related to Goetia. Uh, <laughs> you're just dropping names and I'm like nodding like I know what you're talking about. <laughs> yeah, so, that one. So they, Saw them they in the news will, today. There will be these catalogs of spirits, right? And there's lots of them out there. Yeah, they're right? the Sears catalog of spirits. <laughs> Absolutely. So like, uh, you know, and some people joke, it's kind of like Pokemon. There's like so many of these different spirits. Each one has a different job. They are referred to in this literature as demons. 
Uh, do I believe that they are part of satanic legions? Uh, not always, most of the time, not really. And even Satan, I don't think, is the guy that is portrayed in a lot of this material. The, you know, the Christian view of Satan doesn't jive with how I view. So, but, but okay. in the way, yeah, and I could talk about that a little bit. But if you look at, um, so there's this Renaissance thread of stuff. There's this kind of burst thread of stuff in the earlier times, probably second century to fourth century, where things like Hermeticism came up and Neoplatonism was big, where this worldview kind of came up of, you know, uh, you've got God, right? And then there's sort of these successive, they call them spheres in some cases, but successive layers of stuff. And then you have the earth, right? So the most holy stuff is out here. And in some cases, they'll talk about the planets as the spheres. And so when a person is created uh, or a thing is created, that energy starts at God, gets filtered through all these planetary energies, and then ultimately comes down to Earth. You have spirits and entities at each one of those layers, right? So you will have planetary spirits associated with Saturn, Mars, Venus, Jupiter, all of those planets. Mm -hmm. You also have these uh, spirits that are more aligned with the earth right or under the earth the underworld right right so if it's if it's outside of earth and you know beyond sort of the lunar sphere or whatever that's angels and you know, you know beings of light although they're all not necessarily super friendly or cool um and then you've got these infernal spirits or these underworld spirits, and that's generally what people are calling demons, right? Right. So, um, so like anything else, like working with the saints, to, to be effective, you kind of need to locate, well, what is it I want to accomplish or uh, learn more about? And then you kind of go into your directory and say, okay, like this guy is good at this, and this guy is good at finding treasures, and this guy is good at teaching languages, and this guy is good at this— Find the right one, figure out what's the appropriate method for interacting with them, and then execute on it. And, you know, uh, if you have a good, a positive experience in terms of it was uh, useful, you got good information, something good happened, well, then that's cool. Something bad didn't ha or things didn't happen, well, then you find somebody else to work with. Mm hmm that's kind of how that works. So when people say demons and when you look in some of these texts, yeah, you absolutely see things that look pretty bad. Uh, you will also see some of these demons that are, I would just more characterize them as spirits that you can work with and, um, and, you know, kind of have experiences or learn things with. Okay. Two, two quick questions came yeah. up here. First, mo mo most importantly, would you rather, Laugh with the sinners or cry with the saints? <laughs> <laughs> I'd rather hang out with Billy Joel. Number two, the serious question. While you were describing this and the alignment with planets and everything and Earth, one of the things that, like, we were just talking to a, a UFO guy, really good guy, Ryan Sprague, and we were talking about life on other planets. And we were Earth. saying if, if it was ever proven that there's life on other planets, wouldn't that rock the the foundations of all religions because everything is so earth centric. So mm. is, you know, if, if I went to Alpha Centauri and found a planet that had some kind of life on it, does all this stuff apply to other places or if, is that just a big unknown or? Um, I have no doubt, especially given the sort of revisionist, tendencies of some of the um, political extremists recently where the date that everything's going to happen and the storm's going to come changes all the time. Mm -hmm. And you see this with, you know, the, the, the people who are predicting the apocalypse, like they'll name a date, the date happens, nothing happens, they make a change in the date. I, yeah. I have no doubt that extremists will, you know, figure out a way to make it fit their, their cosmology. Um, I, I will say that there absolutely are certain aspects of, of all of this that are tied to you know, time and place and where we exist in the universe. Um, but I'm also a big proponent of this sort of um, uh, you know, concept of the monad, like God is not a separate thing uh, that lives in some you know, cloud up somewhere. God is everything, right? And all right. of these entities that are listed in all of these books 
are just basically um, focused expressions of different aspects of God. Okay. Right. So when, you know, an angel is part of God, an angel can also be treated and appear to me as a separate entity. But an angel also represents some aspect of God. So Archangel Raphael, right? Name means healer of God. So you need to do healing physically, spiritually, emotionally. You can petition and, and you know, light a candle for Raphael, right? Does that, but it's all, it's all aspects of the one thing. Right. Just right. different different views. Like you take up you take white light and you run a prism through it and you get seven colors. Right. Seven colors are a thing, but they're all part of that light. That's how right. I see that. You know, that's my current working theory of how all this shit works. I was I was fascinated that the Catholic Church has acknowledged that we're probably not the only sentient beings in the universe. Um, it's actually become part of their. Uh, it's a part of their belief system that we aren't alone. Uh, but they even have an observatory. They have holy astronomers. So that's their job is to do this kind of search yeah. and contemplation. Yeah, and I think, I, you know, frankly, I think the only people who don't see a way to reconcile science with religion are the people who are just super close-minded because most of the, you know, I, I don't see any problem reconciling that stuff at all. Yeah. Right. You mean the people who don't believe in dinosaurs and we've just been on the earth for a couple of thousand years? Or, or the people who built the ark in Kentucky and said that the, there were dinosaurs on the ark. Right. There weren't. <laughs> well, you got to go visit the museum and they'll tell you everything. It's very yeah. cool. <laughs> Kentucky very... of all places. A lot of bourbon. A lot of yeah. Bourbon. Yeah. So um, so that that's kind of like view of the world. Um, I think to make this fun, I, I can you know be a little bit specific and talk about some stuff that I did. Unless you guys have other questions. Uh, real quick, we are yeah. big fans of the movie A Dark Song. Sure. How realistic or fake, or is there anything in that you're like, oh, that's a great example. Like when I saw Black Hawk Down, a friend of mine in the uh, in the service was like, that's a really good rep representation of what combat's really like. You know, yeah. So is that like, yeah. do you watch it and go, "That's like the movie you should watch"? Or mm, no. Um, hmm. Okay, so uh, this is the, the well, that was quick. A little <laughs> bit to unpack. Um, okay, uh, it is true that there is uh, a working called the Abramelin operation, which is basically what they're pretending to to uh, mm -hmm. portray in the movie. Um, the Abramelin operation. The goal of Abramelin is to establish knowledge and conversation of your holy garden in angel, which is an entity that is unique to you, that uh, there's lots of debate on what the nature of holy garden in angel is. Some people believe it is from out there, you know, on those outer circles, and it basically busts through and is connected to you. Some people believe it is your future self or your higher self or, or whatever, right? Abramelin operation is pretty specific in terms of how it's laid out and what you need to do. There's a lot of prayer. There's a lot of preparation. So in that respect, I think that was kind of accurate. Uh, it is, uh, depending on which translation you use, a six-month operation, an 18-month operation that culminates in a pretty serious working where you actually achieve knowledge and conversation. And then... After that, you need to basically conjure the demon kings. Uh, you need to subdue them, and they will assign you familiars uh, to work with you, right? The things that I liked about that... that sounds movie, like a lot of work. Oh, it's... Well, look, it's not for the squeamish, and... Well, um, this is where our paths diverge, because I'm like, <laughs> I'm just happy like, hearing to you about it. I can't even get through the book. Yeah, you no. Can I get this done in an hour? No. Yeah, no. Very, very, I, look, Who's that saint that expedites things? Yeah, there, there's not <laughs> a lot of people who have done it by the book. There are people who have, and um, some of them I do, I do kind of take their accounts of their experiences seriously. Um, I don't have, you know, I'm not in a point in my life where that kind of, um, separation from, cause you're, you know, at the, towards the end, you're really isolated. You're not working. You're not interacting with your family. Although people can make, you know, you can make allowances for stuff. Um, but I just, I'm not at the point where I can do that. Now I have done other workings that have included, 
being out in the middle of the woods in a cabin with no electricity for multiple days of uh, prayer and ritual work and you know, interacting with Holy Guardian Angel and all that stuff. So I've had that experience. Now, the purists would not consider that to be really valid or the same thing as knowledge and conversation, but but I have done that. I think the, the there were a couple of things I liked about the movie. One, one was there's this sort of current through the movie of is it working is it not working right, right. Uh, despite the fact that you're hearing voices or seeing things or strange stuff is happening and that is very accurate because you can go to all of this trouble and do all this preparation and fasting and prayer and abstinence and all this stuff for multiple days you get to the working of the thing and you're like nothing's happening right mm -hmm. is this real or you could have an experience where in the moment it seems extremely real and poignant and very good. And then a week later, you can't even remember like stuff that happened. So you get into this and, and there is absolutely an aspect of, of, of auto hypnosis in some of this. In fact, if you can master some of those techniques, it makes the experiences, I think a lot better. Um, but because you are in sort of this trance state, you are you've gotten your mind into this completely different place, right? If you've been mm -hmm. fasting for multiple days and praying and doing all this preparation and building all of this stuff and creating your magical circle and obtaining all these implements and building these implements and doing all this stuff, you get yourself into a pretty unique frame of mind. And once right. it's over, you go back to your normal brain state and you go well was that real right so so what i what i do uh i take a lot of notes to the extent that i can i may record things while it's happening and i often look for things that are um not just like fluffy shit like if you know you talk to angels uh you can find yourself having conversations that sound very similar to you know, hokey channeling people of like, oh, everything's light and we're all brothers. And, and like, I don't care about that. Right. So my interactions would be, what's your job really? Like, what are you here for? What do you do? What can you tell me? What is something that I can basically take away from this? Or what can you do for me if I work with you? Right. Cause it's, you know, like nobody's going to give you enough, something for nothing. So there's always something that you've got to pay, either in effort or in a offering or or whatever, right? So what I will do is if I'm in those situations where I am communicating with some kind of an, a spirit, uh, I will get as much information that is useful for me to understand, is, you know, is this something that's going to be somebody I would want to work with in the past, in the future? And is there information that I am do not know? and could not know that they can provide to me that I can verify independently, right? right. So uh, so I did a working a couple months ago. I was looking for some very specific dates when events would happen this year and took, took notes. And now over the course of this year, I will look to see what happens, right? And to right. see if that comes true. And if that's the case, then that's good, right? But yeah, I, I think... It's a balance of, of going like, oh, how deep do I want to go here? But at the same time, if you don't commit, at least in the moment, you're just dressing up and doing cosplay. Now, when you're meditating, do you mm -hmm. ever use, and I've done this to not a good effect, but beta or theta waves? Have you I heard? Have, I have, you know, like binaural beats and stuff like that. I have used that. I, I, um, Early on, had some pretty trippy experiences. Yeah. Um, I don't use them in my regular practice. I think what my regular practice looks a lot more like kind of pretty standard Buddhism right. practice, you know? Yeah, uh, I got into it when I was doing a lot of Buddhism. And I had a couple of it. My wife always knew when I was doing those because I would rip the headphones off and sometimes scream. Yeah. Like I would see things, yeah, or feel things, or I mean, I was living. I'm like, what the? Heck? Where is this coming from? Like it totally. And I'm like, never again. I actually broke those discs over my knee and threw them in the garbage. Yeah, no, they're they're, they're and I, your experience isn't unique. Oh yeah, the other rule I have is I I will not mix any kind of substances with magic stuff. Right. 
I, I, and some people are big proponents of that. Personally, I'm not. I mean, I'm, you know, I'm a father. I'm a, you know, I, 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 I do not want to mess around with, with certain things. But, but back to the, to, to the, uh, those kind of beta, theta, everything else. Yeah, I think there's something there, right? It, it, it definitely can induce a kind of trance state where you can start to get some pretty weird um, stuff that happens. I, I also had this for a period of time, and it still happens occasionally, but I started listening to podcasts to fall asleep because it was bothering me. Mm -hmm. It was almost like if I was in a quiet place getting ready to go to bed, it was almost like there was a radio playing flipping between channels. You know how like when... Um, Ghost hunters will use those radio things to oh, kind God, of yeah. yes. around. This Frank's it, box. Yeah, like that, but it was in my head. But it was oh. like, yeah, I mean, I was oh, hearing God. Like fragments of sentences and other stuff. Now, I have the benefit, uh, some folks know, I have the benefit. I worked in a psychiatric hospital for, for a couple of years in college, interacted with a lot of people who had serious psychological issues. Also had the opportunity to talk to a lot of um, psychiatrists. And, and and so one of the things one of the doctors said was really informative. I said, like, so how do you know, number one, what's the difference between a voice that a person who's schizophrenic is hearing and the voice that I hear in my head all the time when I'm reading hmm, or doing right. other stuff? Right. And he said, well, everybody's got voices in their head. Right. The difference is the folks who are here who are hospitalized, the voices are telling them bad things. They're telling them to hurt themselves. They're telling them that they're garbage. They're telling them to hurt other people. And these people lack the facility to say, no. <laughs> right. You know, this exactly. isn't real. This is just a thing, right? So it was more annoying than anything that I would get these kind of sentence fragments and this and that. And like, you know, it really became uh, problematic for me to get to sleep because I was just getting all of this stuff. And it wasn't like, one long sentence that made sense. It was right. like phrases and it was loud in my head. And I'm like, Jeez, oh, okay, that's this, terrifying. Yeah. This is jacked up right now. I have a great network of folks who can support me and answer questions and who are much, much further along than I am. And so they're able to say, yeah, okay, this happens. This is what it is. It's not a big deal. And you know, it's not necessarily going to stay. And, you know, this could be because this is what this was prior to me making any kind of contact with Holy Guardian Angel. This could be like initial connection. Right? You could mm -hmm. be getting that initial communication. And because you haven't really done the work, it's getting mixed up in, in the translation. Right. So, you know, yeah, it's weird. And it and it, it is a little scary at first, but then it becomes more like I just want to go to sleep. You know? Yeah. Now, was that voice, was it consistently sound the same in your head? No, and it was all different. All different. Sometimes, like, yelling. Sometimes just saying weird, like, random words. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. That yeah. scared the shit out of me. Yeah, just crazy, <laughs> crazy. And, and so, and like I said, I stood, I now I fall asleep with podcasts, because I also have, like, permanent ringing my ears from too many concerts. Uh, right? Hey, so, so I'm in me, that club. Yeah, to me, being in a in a quiet, silent room is like torture. I fall asleep to Bob's Burgers every night. Yeah, so so just <laughs> that's, having some that's kind my of noise thing right now could be a fan, could be whatever, but having the podcast going takes care of all that stuff. Did you write down any of those phrases and kind of just meditate on those phrases and try I to have, figure out what I, that I might... have in the past? It's been it's been a while <laughs> since I've, I've I've had that stuff. But I did keep notes for a while, and it just didn't make any sense. Right. Like, it wasn't like it was telling me something like, oh, hey, tomorrow you're going to have a car accident. Or, I mean, it was just like, you know. They never give you the lottery almost, numbers? It almost literally felt like I was hearing the inside of somebody else's head as they were doing really, like, non you know, inconsequential stuff like, you know, oh, put the pan over there. Right. Too bad it wasn't Jack. Ah, meatloaf. <laughs> <laughs> I would have loved that. I would have loved that. Hey, back right? to back to the angel thing real quick. Yeah, yeah, sure. So do do you Oh it's... yeah, I did have another point about Dark Song I want to make, but you go ahead. Oh. It just seems like you do you have the answer to Jamie Walters slash Ray Pruitt's question of how do you talk to an angel? Yeah, sure, absolutely. From... If if you if you really want to know, I can certainly <laughs> provide you with some 
research. Because all I my 90210 friends are dying to know. <laughs> yeah, no, I heard that song in the in this grocery market the other day, and it made me very happy. <laughs> um, you the, you the speak to them in Acadian. Yeah, the other thing I liked about Dark Song was at the end, the way that they did represent that angel. Mm. Uh, I, I think, you know, while not 100% consistent with my experience, was had a similar aspect to it of like, yeah, this isn't just like some guy my size. Like, they can be a very imposing, fearful, major, overpowering kind of thing. Mm-hmm. Right? Like, it is impressive it is like you know glory of god kinds of things when you have the right uh interaction right and are you mostly encountering this when you're doing something alone or are you would in a group of people at a ceremony or something when you're experiencing stuff um it's both i mean obviously coronavirus has really prevented any kind of major group work but we've done group work in the past all kinds that I've had interesting experiences. I think one of the things I also have noticed um, in a particularly like charged situation, I will start to feel a little bit of nausea in my stomach. And, and so that's how I know something is either happening or about to go down. Yeah. Yeah. Like I will start to physically feel like something is happening yeah, you know, if you're doing a conjuration or whatever, like, okay, yeah, okay, it's happening. Uh, you know, my vision might start to get a little bit funky. Um, I might start to, you know, like, if I'm if you're using some kind of, like, scrying medium, like a mirror or a uh, uh, crystal ball or whatever, you might, that might be, like, the indication, like, yep, stuff is just about to happen. Wow. Yeah. Now, I don't know how deep you can go. Now, you've... you've hinted at you've had some experiences have been like Mm -hmm. okay so what's something that you did that shook you yeah and something that kind of was like you know the light is shining down on you all right polar opposites um i don't know if i've talked about this one too much i've written a little bit about it on one of the discords um but uh i was kind of going through this period because part part of what you start to see as you're doing these sort of historical group things or whatever it really does feel like a lot of self-improvement stuff and so there isn't a whole lot of interaction with like the outside world either finances or people or or whatever which is part of the reason why i started to do a little bit stuff that looked more like folk magic because um, while i've been fortunate and blessed to you know have a financially stable life and have a stable relationship with my family and my wife and all that stuff. Um, there, there have been times where I have needed um, outside uh, assistance, right? I'm a firm believer of um, in order for anything to want to help you, you have to do everything you can physically possibly do in the real world. And when you've exhausted all of your options, that's when you maybe ask for outside help, right? So I had a situation last year, uh, the very beginning before Corona was kicked in, but it was starting to kick in. And so my job is in sales and um, the count, the company was counting on me bringing in a couple million dollars in business by the end of March. Right. So Corona is starting to ramp and I'm close, but not going to get there. And it's like the week before the end of March and the big deal that needs to come in. Uh, so there was four, but there was one really big major one, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, I talked to the vice president and they said, look, I've signed off everything I can sign off, but it's got to go through our procurement process. And that takes 14 days, right? Right. 10 business days, two weeks. You're not going to make it. There's nothing I can do. Like the process is the process. So I sat down and said, okay, you know, I've talked to everybody I can possibly talk to. I've done everything I can possibly do. Corona is about to shut everything down. People are going to stop spending money. If I don't get this money in now, I am screwed, right? Right. And my company is screwed. So I need to do something, right? So part of the work is figuring out, okay, what's going to work? Like, what is the best modality for me to use to be able to, like, 
get the desired effect. And so I figured, well, there's no reason why I shouldn't pull out the stops because I'm completely stressed out and I need to make this happen. So I created a little working that took place over four days. There were a couple of different aspects to it. Some were pretty traditional, some were not so traditional. So I did those. And literally on March 31st, 5 p.m., everything came in. Oh, seven days, you know, five business days before anybody said it was even remotely possible. Right. And so my request, you know, I kind of combined on all these workings was by 5 p.m., this all needs to be in. Right now. You know, and, and it came in with the guy saying, I have no idea what the hell happened. <laughs> I don't I've never seen this happen before. And I've worked here for 30 years. You were like, like, I know how this happened. And he said, yo, stars must have been aligned for you guys. And I said, well, yeah, yeah kind of. <laughs> right. So 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 there that was an example of like completely outside of my control, completely outside of me. It wasn't like some cold. Well, maybe I shouldn't be talking about this. Stars it wasn't, some, it wasn't <laughs> some kind of cold reading thing. It wasn't like wishful thinking. It was a very specific, tangible outcome based on a very specific request. Like it happened. Right. So that's a good example because, you know, had a happy ending. Uh, company did good. I got paid. Uh, everybody was happy. So uh, yeah. that's a good story. Yeah. What yeah. about the? I, I might need that help now. I'll talk to, <laughs> I'll talk to you off air. <laughs> I, I don't, I don't do work for hire. Uh, I it. have, I have done work for people, but I, I will not accept money. If that's you could put in a word. <laughs> Just, yeah. Sure. Slip, uh, slip, sure. slip the deity is a, a 10. What, what about spooky stuff? You've told me a few things that have. Uh... Oh, yeah. So uh, um, part part of the work is uh, is, you know, maybe a little bit darker ish, scary ish, even though I'm not doing negative stuff. So, you know, did did a working that was conjurations of demonic forces uh, and. Um, I will say that, uh, I went into it with a fair amount of trepidation, um, because I had not really done a working quite like that before. Uh, and so, um, but, but, you know, by this time I know what to do when shit goes wrong. Uh, I know how to do things right so that it's, you know, you're creating a safe environment, I know how to, you know, like if I need to get rid of things quickly and clear the space out, I know how to do that, right? And and so, you know, and part of this work, right? If you look in the grimoires and everything else, part of this work is similar to the way you do an exorcism or anything else, because some of the some of the methods are based on exorcism protocols, right? Mm -hmm. You are you are basically claiming the authority of God, claiming the authority of the angels, claiming all of these things. Uh, it, and if you really believe it, then you can pretty much do anything in terms of what you're interacting with. And you will have come from a place of authority. If you show weakness, it's just like with a wild animal or whatever, right? This you is show like weakness. Salem's Lot with the cross. Absolutely. Right. <laughs> Salem's Lot or Fright Night Fright or Night. any of that stuff. You know, if, if, if you do it right, you're, you're fine. So, um, so, you know, perform this had very weird stuff happened, felt sick to my stomach, smelled weird things, started kind of seeing strange stuff in my peripheral vision. Uh, I get everything kind of locked down. I do the working. I, I communicate, you know, and just for everybody's benefit, you know, if you have a scrying mirror, do anything else, you're not like, it's not like watching a TV. You're not like seeing stuff like you and I talking. Not like Frodo you. looking into the no <laughs> it's not like that at all but you will get pretty strong impressions and depending on how good you are at visualizing and interacting like that's how it works and you may hear voices that you can generally assume are not your own uh so finally get this conjuration cooking get this entity there start asking questions get responses that surprise me right so let's say you talk to the devil for example, mm -hmm. and the devil, you know, I said, okay, so what's your deal, right? And the devil's like, hey, everything's part of God. I'm doing my job basically for God. I'm not, you know, like, so uh, there's, there's 
goodness and badness to everything. And I'm basically here to ultimately bring the perfection of creation, right? right? So the resolution of, you know, humanity and the story of the world and everything else, like everybody's just doing their job, dude. So, you know, some people are bad people. Some people are good people. This is my job and I'm doing it right. Which I didn't expect, you know, I was expecting much more spooky, scary stuff. Um, but that was weird. You know, you do you do get flashes of stuff where, you know, similar to what, what Hunter was saying around uh, this thing, you know, like I just got this impression to go here, do this, find that, do whatever. Probably the scariest stuff that I experienced was just some of the unusual people that have scary or extraordinary claims. Um, but usually it's more mental illness or just LARPing than than, than anything else i mean I, I i you know yeah have i been intimidated in some of these ritual situations or a little bit scared or whatever yeah of course mm -hmm. of course i like the idea of satan saying look i'm just working for this guy and you know i'm the boogeyman and sometimes when the big guy needs you to run to him you need a boogeyman to run from yeah so we're kind of working hand in hand here yeah yeah i mean i we're was trying to get you to the same place that's right. That's right. I mean, it's very different perspective and just kind of to tie in, uh, you know, my my personal philosophy these days, you know, started out in this kind of Christian trend. I'm much closer to probably a Christian worldview than I was ever before. But like I said, it doesn't look like anything like what, you know, happens in church. Um, right. You know, I do I do believe in God? I do believe in the you know, Son of God. I believe in His role. I don't know if it played out anything like it said, um, and have gotten a lot from some of the more contemplative, mystical side of Christianity than than almost anything else. Which is amazing because you a lot of people would think the road you took would push you so far from Christianity, right? But it's actually brought you closer. Yeah, uh, because it because it's all the one thing, right? It's right. like, you know, you just come full circle and say, okay, everything's God. Um, I love the Kabbalistic view of like why the world is screwed up, right? And th th in that the, the mission of humanity is basically to heal the world, right? Raise the mm -hmm. sparks back up, heal the world, do this. That's how you perfect creation. God needs us to help him cr like basically perfect creation. What's your kind of, a thousand foot view of Jesus. I, I, literally, that was going to be my question. <laughs> um, uh, Jesus as sort of the uh, kind of the, the the reconciler between God and man is is kind of how I look at that. That you've got this you've got this figure that you know in some re some aspects represents the notion around resurrection you know and you can point to all the other resurrection myths around osiris and everything else right but i think that it's helpful to have this uh concept of new life and resurrection and reconciliation and all of those kinds of things because you know whether you, whether or not you believe in sin or like there's a little devil on your shoulder or whatever right I think everybody can benefit from the notion of sort of reconciling with themselves and reconciling with God. And I see Jesus as a representation of that. Now, do you think he was an actual person that was part man, part deity? Or if he was real, was he an incredible philosopher? I, you know, I don't know. I don't know. Uh, a couple of years back, my wife and I, um, her family was kind enough to, to uh, pay for all of her peer, her siblings and spouses and everything to do a tour in Israel. Um, mm -hmm. And to be, you know, in Galilee and to go to Nazareth and to go to Bethlehem and to be in Jerusalem, especially to go into the Church of the Holy Sepulchre, right. which was like blew me away. You know, do the Via Dolorosa, end up at Church of the Holy Sepulchre, see where they're saying like, yeah, this is the hill this is the hole where the cross was you know this is the place where jesus is buried and just feel like the aura of that place you're like well something's going on for sure right i think one of the cool things that gets underplayed is you know the, the i would say the oral tradition and myth was jesus was crucified on the same hill where the bones of adam were buried right i is that true 
Uh, well, I that's don't remember that tradition. Now, now, what's awesome is if you go into Church of the Holy Sepulchre, you go up onto the hill. When you go downstairs, you immediately take a left. There is a thing called the Chapel of Adam, and it's the rock underneath Calvary that is cracked where supposedly the skull of Adam was. So in in the in the tradition, blood of Jesus, you know, Jesus died, rock cracked, blood of Jesus went down all the way to the skull of Adam. And wow. so it, it kind of um, represented and effectively performed a kind of baptism of Adam and kind of clearing of the line of humanity uh, of, you know, of sin and everything else, but basically doing that reconciliation function. Hmm. So wow. you can go, you, yeah, you can go see that Chapel of Adam. There's a lot of different pictures uh, of, of paintings where if you look closely at the, um, at the cross, look at the base of the cross. You're going to see a skull. That's what that represents. Oh wow! Wow. Yeah. Now here's what I want to know: Where are the Nephilim buried? Where can I go find their their uh, resting grounds? Uh, I don't know. Uh, if I knew, I you know probably. It's wouldn't so help. weird because when you read Genesis and you're reading about Adam and Eve and there's this giants and stuff, you're like, well, where the hell did they come from? Yeah, read, read Book of Enoch if you really want to get the good shit. <laughs> right? that that's that goes into a lot more detail about the watchers and the nephilim and and, and all of that stuff yeah well i saw watch a very interesting uh or a documentary i think it was on netflix or something about the devil and mm -hmm. the representation of the devil and how like sure. i think it's in italy somewhere there's a painting in some chapel or something that like they believe is the first representation of I, th I guess it was satan or lucifer or whatever mm -hmm. whatever and he started off blue yeah. And, and, yeah. and and evolved and stuff so when you watch something like that again coming from the your upbringing and, and you, you know there just comes a time in your life where you're like everything they told me is true and then you start to hear things like well wait everybody all the books in the bible were decided by a room full of guys hundreds of years after it happened and if they had decided that this book instead of that book it would have been different and then we right. were like, oh, the devil, well, that started because of this, and they, they, and here's how the thing evolved. And you're like, oh, okay, so, you know, I've got to really, th well, you, you got to really rethink some of this yeah. stuff. Well, you also think, well, I'm pretty sure that a guy 2,000 years ago in Israel did not look like Chris Cornell. That's right. I'm That's right. pretty sure these depictions are off. Yeah, no, <laughs> no. I, you, so... Um, the, the Israel thing was eye-opening for a lot of different reasons. Uh, it was pretty impressive. I had experiences like I did not anticipate, you know, like oh, just a lot of this stuff. Um, the group we were with was pretty mainstream evangelical stuff, so I had to educate them on things like Skull of Adam and some right. of the other weird esoteric Christianity stuff, which was kind of fun. Um, does this play into any kind of thoughts about the afterlife or the next step would be ghosts and hauntings and stuff like is, did you have, does does any of this stuff make you think like oh yeah hauntings are this or that or you don't know or that's all BS you know or... I, i'm not sure uh so there's this whole thread of of activity around kind of ancestor work it's not not really worship but it's kind of working with your ancestors i see it as being beneficial because i'm at least honoring you know, my ancestral lineage and the people who sacrificed and cared for and loved for my family and, and would love, you know, if there is um, any way for them to continue to do that, I'm, I'm all for that, right? Um, I think that, you know, in, in this kind of line of activity, you interact or seems like you have interactions with all kinds of things. Uh, I don't think that there's anything that I could kind of conclusively say, yep, oh, that was a ghost of a specific person. Um, and that happened, but, I, you know, I'm, I'm willing to keep an open mind. If I, if I'm doing all this other stuff, it would be sort of, uh, <laughs> insincere for me to say, no, it's all bullying. And there's stuff that I do say, no, that's complete horseshit. But, um, right. I, you know, my, my personal view of, of post physical life has changed so much over the years, um, that, uh, you know, personally, I'm not sure if, uh, you retain your own kind of personal individual consciousness when you die. Um, but I believe something persists, right? Right. I mean, yeah, if, if you're doing this work, I think if you're open-minded enough, you see enough where you think, 
Yeah, th this isn't all there is. Like you yeah. know now, th yeah. that's what this computer, this table I'm on. This, yeah, this isn't all that there is. So there's way more. For and sure, if that can exist. I'm sure. I'm, and since we're all, I, I, I feel I'm probably similar to you. We are all part of the exact same thing. Like everything, I, I am connected as much to you as I am to this ring light, to yeah. a planet, to whatever. Yeah. So you just kind of go from here to there. Whatever whatever survives this, who knows what it is. But right. I think there's something. Right. Yeah. And again, all these experiences that I've had and all this stuff that I do, I continually go back and say, okay, was that, what was that, right? Like... Uh, one of my first mottos in one of the orders was like looking for the source of things because I was trying to understand what really was everything. Mm -hmm. I I know less now than I know then, right? Mm -hmm. uh, I, You've I asked can, too many questions. Yeah, I can I can <laughs> kind of you know record my experiences. I can kind of say, yep, there's a lot of things that I will have sort of an open mind around. Um, I just know that. Um, the model that I had back in my twenties of like, yep, it's just like physical reality and that's it. Like that doesn't, you know, I, I've pretty much proven to myself that that was completely not, not a useful worldview for me. Right. Yeah. Well, and when okay. you started this journey, yeah, your explanation to me was you simply said, I'm just curious that if there's anything to this, I'd like yeah. to know. Because the yeah, two of us would sit there watching in search of and go, yeah, that's BS. But I wonder, yeah, you know. Right, right. Yeah. So it's been, you know, I've had a lot of fun. I think, like I said, I've become a much better person. Um, yeah. I've met some, yeah, I've met <laughs> some very cool people uh, and uh, had some some really unique experiences. Uh, so it's it's been a good thing. What I would love, and this, you don't do it now, but yeah. After this interview, if you could give us a list of some, you would think, essential books for people to start their own exploration. We can include them in the show notes. Sure. Because I think it's good to have somebody who has kind of separated the wheat from the chaff. Yeah, yeah. And knows. And I, I know a lot of people listening to this are going to start going, oh, I want to look into this. But I want to point them in the right direction. Yeah, yeah. I'd be and happy to do that. I'd be happy to do that. Yeah, there's some, there's, some, there's some very good stuff out there. And I'm really encouraged uh, despite the TikTok which is cursing the moon and whatnot, um, <laughs> there are some younger folks who are doing the work and doing the research and putting out entertaining but but reasonably well researched content. Mm -hmm. uh, and to me, that that's exciting because um, when I started this 20 years ago, you know, there was not a ton of stuff out there. In terms of books or videos or anything right you had to know somebody or just be lucky and find the right books right. Um, now there's it's like so much stuff and so to see younger people actually be serious about this and not goof around and hex this hex the moon uh <laughs> is really encouraging if you're That's our good. age the only thing you know about alistair crowley is from jimmy page and led zeppelin <laughs> uh, yeah and sergeant pepper <laughs> exactly yeah now, Didn't he have could, a place on Loch Ness? Yes. Yeah, it burned down yeah. twice. We could have a whole long conversation about that, but I'm I'm yeah. getting to the point where we probably should wrap up. Yeah, yeah absolutely. I want I want to go do some magic. Yep. I'm, I'm gonna, gonna go I'm gonna so work real my, quick uh, question: Is this magic? Run the house magic. Yes. Are we talking magic with a C or with a K? Uh, I don't make a distinction. A lot of the Crowley Thelemites, you know, like love the K. Um, like for the headline I, of this show, the K oh, would be the sexier headline. K will probably get you more hits. Yeah. Yeah. yeah go with what the K. What about CK? Why don't, we oh, just, yeah. why don't we create something new here, man? Lewis CK magic. <laughs> <laughs> oh, God. That's the bad know, stuff. Don't so do stupid. that. Yeah. 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 Don't do that. Keep your pants uh, on. Let me see. Oh, yeah. We didn't even talk about the, the other prohibition, which, which came from my lovely wife, was no sex magic. So, oh, uh, they uh, ruined everything. <laughs> <laughs> if you could just send me some good books on that. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> you, have you gotten to the Kama Sutra that I gave you? Are you finished with that? Yet? <laughs> uh, right, this is awesome, man. This is yeah, a good way to start my day. This has been fun. Thank you, guys. I appreciate, like, 
this kind of conversation stuff. It's, uh, you know, I haven't really talked about this in any kind of public way before. So, well, appreciate you, uh, doing it. This is a lot of personal stuff, you know, yeah. so appreciate you, uh, uh, sharing it with us. And like I said, now the two of us are like not going to be able to sleep tonight. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And happy to have a, you know, future conversations or offline conversations. If you got questions or like, you know, need stuff and I'll, I'll track down some resources you can stick in the show notes and cool. we can go from there. Yeah. That'd be awesome. So everybody, next time you hear me and Jack on monster and go, Morgan, Morgan. Now, you know, pound, pound on the door. <laughs> Cool. All right. Thank you, Morgan. Right, and um, have a good rest of your day. Let's call this a let's call this a show. And we'll everybody. We'll see you next time on Monster Man. Monster Man.